As we go through today, we'll do the following. There'll be an update from me on the COVID situation, and then a, a reflection on what are the things that uh, countries and local communities ought to not only have in place, but be able to measure. I want to share with you the seven indicators in the dashboard that I've been working on with, um, with Dale Fisher and colleagues in Singapore. And the, the, the reason for this is that it really becomes more important than ever for governments and local authorities to be able to be clear with each other, not just on how many COVID cases they've got, but how well they're dealing with them. You see, just to know that there is an increase in cases doesn't help us, because in the end, if that increase in cases can be managed, then life can go on, and there's no need for a national lockdown. If the increase in cases cannot be managed, then of course a lockdown may well be the only option, but it has terrible, terrible impact on people's economies, people's social lives, and on children, particularly for education, for nutrition, and so on. So I've almost become a, a, a kind of advocate for no more lockdowns, but not because I want to let the virus go crazy, but because I think we ought, to, as humanity, to be able to have better ways to deal with this threat than just simply going into lockdown. Not everywhere, and I'm just going to, I'm going to give you a couple of instances where I think a lockdown is justified, even though it's horribly painful. But my core hope is that as a world, we'll be able to learn to live with this virus without cessation of all economic and social activity. So as we go in, I'll just start with my beginning piece on where is the pandemic. And I've been looking at data on numbers of new cases, and definitely, definitely they are plateauing around the world, still at very high levels. But I'm looking at a, at a, a graph where the numbers are coming to a plateau. And uh, I'm going to share this in my narratives each week uh, and into the narrative that I hope we will post today. You'll see that the total number of cases per day has stayed pretty static for the last three weeks. And that's because the numbers of cases reported to WHO are continuing to reduce overall, even in Europe. They're starting to stabilize in the Americas, and just about slowing down in South Asia, but it's still quite high, the numbers there. And interestingly, the reported numbers from Africa are also not increasing. Part of me says, this is because of behavior change and increased physical distancing, mask wearing, because I do believe that that certainly brings the numbers of people who are infected by a, a person who's got the virus down quite substantially. Uh, but also, I think it's because of a real focus on public health services. I'm, I'm not saying we're doing it. I'm not saying we've won. I'm just saying I, I really do sense that there is a concerted effort underway and that at least when tests are being done, the, the positives are staying stable. My continuous worry is there are parts of the world where there's no testing and the virus is still spreading uh, wildly. And uh, we won't know the answer to that until we've got, I'm afraid, historical record. Now, I want to get the narrative right. I, I want people everywhere just to kind of get centered in their heads. This is a dangerous virus, not going away. And the way, way, the way in which humanity will come to terms with the virus is by 
being really smart and being able to defend ourselves against it. And, and you know I have these seven strategy lines that I've been repeating quite regularly. And this time, rather than just go through the seven strategy lines, I want to put them into what, what we might call a virtual dashboard for how we tell whether or not a society is able to get ahead of this virus. I mean, we start with the people, um, whether or not the people themselves are able to take it seriously, and whether they are ready to introduce more physical distancing, mask wearing, hygiene, cough hygiene, and hand hygiene, and the discipline of isolation when you've got symptoms and not being around and, and threatening other people. Four things that are so important. Say it again, physical distancing, mask wearing, uh, hygiene, and the discipline of self-isolation. Now, obviously not everybody in the population is going to do it, but as I look around the world, there is absolutely no doubt that the message is starting to get through, and that, that these practices are going to be key to getting what we call the R number, the number of people who are infected by an individual, down below one. So, seven things that I see governments and others trying to get right. Well, yes, you've got to be having a testing strategy and trying to pick up people with the disease. Uh, and if you're doing a good testing strategy, as we look across the numbers, we find that usually you end up with about three or four percent who are positives. If you're not testing enough, then your numbers of positives will be higher. And so to have a really good testing program and to be concentrating on those who are at particular risk is desirable. And so we come to indicator number one. In the country, is there the ability to detect and to break chains of transmission. That's number one because that really is the most important one. You don't get rid of this virus unless you can break the transmission chain. You can only break the transmission chain by having the capacity at the local level to find people with the disease and to isolate them and to trace their contacts and to isolate them. And so at the center of the work that we're asking our, all governments and others to do is the capacity to break these chains. We've called it two things when we've been discussing amongst ourselves, chain breaking and cluster busting. I'm sure that these kinds of terms will not survive. But it was interesting, I was in a factory recently, and the director of operations was very proud of their ability to find cases and bust the clusters, and the way in which he built up cooperation with the workers so that they were involved in the cluster busting themselves. And you, you first, when you're looking at these kinds of problems, you first of all see a chain of cases. And then it builds up to what we call a cluster with transmission inside the cluster. And so breaking the chain and busting the cluster are key attributes that you really want to have everywhere. And we're gonna need them everywhere. It's just the, the, the new normal. The second of the indicators that we, we've been working on is to do with the healthcare system. Because yes, we do depend on the healthcare system to keep deaths down, to pick up people who are not breathing properly, to pick up people who seem to have got clots, to pick up people uh, who look like they're going into more severe organ failure. I've got one very close friend um, whose mother has, has been in intensive care or on the edge of intensive care now for 120 days. I mean, this is this is, these are giant things, and they're, they're really difficult. Uh, and keeping people alive is hard, 
But at the same time, there have got some people who are just most amazingly tenacious and say, I'm not going to let this virus kill me. And so having a good healthcare system that's got the protocols right is important. Uh, as we learn more and more about different forms of COVID, particularly the long tail COVID, it's really important that the healthcare system is geared up for it. And another third indicator is what's the ability of the healthcare system to maintain usual services, including those which are completely unrelated to the pandemic. And my particular obsession is services for health and well-being of women and of children, particularly reproductive health care, child care, is it preventive in particular for immunization? Uh, but I'm also concerned about cancer care and concerned about care for other non-communicable diseases and making sure that the health system is able to continue to function seems to me to be a key performance indicator. I think that at the heart of our understanding of COVID is that it does affect certain groups of people much worse than others. There are groups that are vulnerable. They are the low pain. They are people living in very confined accommodation. They are people who don't find it easy to access care. There is an enormous and profound inequity associated with COVID. It is a disease of the poor. So a fourth performance indicator is, is their capacity in society to protect and to support vulnerable groups. And if so, let that capacity be in place. In Singapore, the vulnerability of people living in foreign worker dormitories was identified and a special program was put in place that in the long term, it's clear that there will have to be a change in the conditions under which these workers are accommodated. And as there's more and more evidence that migrant workers all over Europe and North America are high risk of COVID, then we have to have a much more sober reflection on the conditions under which they live. And people in residential care, younger people, older people, constant, constant reflection there. And particularly where we've got those services privatized, it's really important that there is a, a strong dialogue between the owners of the facilities, as well as the workers in the facilities, those people who have been cared for and their relatives, and wider society just about how, as a community, we do want to care for older people, because COVID has revealed a real unsatisfactory situation. So find the vulnerable, look after them. Don't sweep the issues under the carpet. COVID's giving us a chance to clean our act up. Right at the center of my performance indicators, coming in number five, is how well are healthcare workers protected? You see, if we can't make sure that our healthcare workers are able to be protected, then what on earth are we trying to do? And, and that perhaps, when history is written, will be one of the things we're most ashamed about. Something like three to five percent of deaths in several settings are due, uh, are among healthcare workers. We have to give that a higher priority, and that's all healthcare workers. One indicator that we've added, number six, relates to whether or not people who are put into isolation actually are remunerated while they're there, or whether they lose money. You can't expect people to self-isolate if they're going to have a financial penalty. So we're very keen that there is attention given to whether or not, as people self-isolate, they are financially covered. There'll be all sorts of anxiety about this. Are people perhaps claiming that they've been exposed when they haven't been exposed? But in our experience, if you can't trust people to be able to be honest about this, it's never going to work. And if you can't cover the cost, it's never going to work. If you look at one factory, where workers who were isolating were receiving one quarter of the amount that they would normally get when they're working. And they've got rent, they've got to pay, they've got other goods to, to, to cover in their domestic expenditure. 
and taking a cut down to one quarter when you're on low wages. Not good. You're not going to comply. You're going to come to work. You're going to say, I'm going to work through my COVID, but in, in the process, you'll you're probably foster a, a cluster of cases. So it's, it's really essential that the incentive structures are right. And then our seventh uh, indicator is just making sure that supplies are coming through right across the board. You know, but the reality is that COVID has been an excuse for all sorts of supply chain interruptions. And so we've got to make sure that they're resilient and robust, whether we're talking about medicines or food or any other necessity. So seven indicators. The ability to detect and break transmission chains. I put that right at the center. The ability of the healthcare system to actually minimize death and disability. The ability of the healthcare system to look after people who've got non-COVID cases, get non-COVID sickness. The ability to protect and support vulnerable groups. The ability to protect healthcare workers and other essential personnel. The financial support available for people who are isolating to make sure that they're not discriminated against. And then the ability to keep the supplies flowing for everything people need. These are the kind of things that I believe need to be in place in order that societies are able to deal with a constant threat of COVID. I'm not saying you just focus on the numbers of cases. I am saying you focus on the capacity of society to handle the threat. That, for me, is the most important communication task that we have right now. We dig into it, okay? We have still got problems all over the world in factories. Factories where people are stuck together close. Factories that are cold because they're concerned with food. And we're looking at this very, very carefully because we actually think there's real work to be done there. As we look around the world, we see a big challenge in schools, partly because there's still so much uncertainty about children and COVID. I've just seen a new report come through. UK is one a big study of children in hospital in England, Scotland, and Wales. They looked at total admissions, 651 during the period, a couple of months ago, and there were less than 1% for children. And the only children who were really in trouble were children with other illnesses. And so I think on the basis of who comes in ill, there's a real consensus that kids don't get so sick. If you can hear the few, the few examples of this, multi, multi-organ hypersensitivity syndrome called Kawasaki-like illness, but it's super rare. And some are saying, well, hang on a bit, you know, we've learned with adult COVID that you can't just look at death, you've got to look at the people who are, are suffering, and particularly those with long tails. So are there children who are getting a phenomenon like long tail, long -tail COVID? We just don't know. But we, we found with other diseases that we have to look at those who, who recover as well as those who die. But the general situation is, Children are not getting hit badly, but the virus does get into schools, adults are in the schools, and then it can move from the school to the home. And even in South Korea, super organized in how it's dealing with COVID, they are having a real stop start issue with their schools. And because there's, in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, so many kids going back to school right now, and there's such a lot of public debate about this, uh, this is something we're looking at very carefully. We're, we're taking our cue from Maria Van Karkova, the epidemiologist at WHO, and we've been really pouring over some new guidance that's come from WHO and UNICEF and the International Pediatric Association. And it's really good that they've, I think, taken the challenge on and said, look, actually, older children are like adults. 
treat them like adults. So that's why the, the guidance is saying we should be ready for masking over the age of 12. And in certain circumstances where there's a suspicion of high risk of transmission in younger age groups, 5 to 11, and I belong to that group that says, yes, hand it to the children, let them take responsibility. They will. They will. Just like they take responsibility for hygiene, often telling their parents to wash their hands. Just like they take responsibility for cleanliness. They'll be able to do it. And I think it'd be great if there is a stronger focus on universal precautions among adults, but also a stronger precaution of, uh, focus on universal precautions among uh, uh, adolescents. And my, my colleague Catherine has been saying, remember, universities are going back as well. And she describes a situation in many American universities where they started to welcome back undergraduates. And actually, some of them have had to close. Not close, 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 but just make the students actually you better not come here. And we'll do stuff online. Is that right, Kathy? That's great. It, it, it certainly is. Ooh. Sorry. Uh,
Uh, you, you will be able to move from strong lockdowns to loosening things up. And so it went on like that. And, and I thought, okay, I've navigated this one. But then they kind of took out of the interview a, a, a sort of snippet, which was then uh, made, put in a little audio file and attached to a tweet saying, WHO envoy says New Zealand should be more like Sweden. And of course, that's playing into a political narrative in the country because you know we, we're saying just into Arda has done brilliant in leading New Zealand through COVID, but she's also coming up to an election shortly. And that's, that's the tough part when you're, you know, I'm a, a relentless communicator. I want to try to get the narrative right, but it gets tough when you're quoted out of context. And actually that happens super often. But I, I think you can't stop that. It's just that we need to try to continually connect so that we are spreading the narrative that Yes, as humanity, we will learn to live with the virus. As humanity, this will require us sharing. As humanity, it will mean we stop competing with each other and pretending that one country's got it right and the other country hasn't. And good journalists will help us carry that message. So one of the things that I'm talking with colleagues about is getting the journalism right. And that leads me to where we're going. We are saying, hey world, We've got this big, big, big challenge for everybody going on right now. Behaviour changed by 7.8 or so billion people, all at the same time. And we've got to do it, because otherwise, we start with communications between countries, dealing with issues like going back to university, it just gets so, so hard, because we're all looking at it differently. So actually, the campaign is getting ourselves COVID ready. And that's the slope. Let's get COVID ready. We want to keep that phrase, COVID ready. We want to get it picked up by loads of people. We don't want to run the campaign. We haven't got the resources, but we would like to see the idea of a campaign. And we're going to go on talking about it. We talk about it with you. You'll help shape it. We talk about it. Whenever we do webinars, we talk about it with people in official settings, but campaigns are best when they come from inside society. And so sowing the seeds for this campaign is something we're doing more and more. And if others are doing similar things, let them do it. All we're saying is let's get ourselves COVID ready because then life can go on. And we just don't have to have this world being brought to a stuttering halt because we don't get it together in our head and how to deal with it. Humanity is able to deal with this kind of challenge. It's got to, because we're going to have a much bigger challenge with climate change that's still there, and we've got a huge challenge with nature, huge challenge with migration, inequity. These giant challenges, they're not going to go away just because some president says that they're going to disappear as so though somehow these people know the future. No, they're not going to go away. And so that's why we're just not going to give up. So I hope that's helpful. It's helpful to me to share it with you because what I'm doing is, is working through with you the logic. And then you come back and you comment. You've got all these things coming through in the chat. And each one of you who I know, because now we're quite a select group, has got observations. You work for organizations that are capable of transforming. And you may find the campaign idea is helpful. So I hope you'll come in and just talk about anything that I've raised, anything else. I will stack a briefing here of things that I've found going on around the world. And uh, here's the people I'm going to ask to say a word or two. First of all, Twee, to just give us the results of the poll. I'm going to uh, actually go ask people who've talked before. I, I'm going to ask Sarah Phillips if she's okay to say a word or two. I'd love to ask Fawzia Rashid if she's got anything that she'd like to contribute. Uh, Fawzia is from Art Khan and um, uh, it'd be, be wonderful to hear your thoughts and also anything coming within your, within your organization. Iman Ahmed in Canada 
been lovely to hear from you, uh, Loy Rago. Uh, I think you've got some questions about narrowness of the of the analysis, and I think it's good if you wide, widen it. I just say I have got a bit health system focused, Lloyd, because I think we have got to get the health part right. But of course, at the same time, we've got to work on so many other issues, and it'd be good for you to remind us. Annie Felton, if you feel like it, it'd be great to hear from you. Uh, and then uh, other people, uh, Godfrey, last time your microphone wasn't working, so if your microphone's working, do, do come in. So thank you for lighting yourselves up. The other thing is when you light yourselves up on the video, uh, that means that I know that you wouldn't mind connecting and it's super helpful for me. Um, so that means that uh, anybody who's on the video, please don't be uh, embarrassed if I call on you, but if you don't want to be called on, just put a note in the, in the chat. Uh, I'd like to greet, as always, uh, people who we work closely with uh, over the months, especially we haven't seen you for a bit. Maurizio, nice that you're with us. I'm so, so pleased, I hope you're well. That's Maurizio Calderon. Uh, thank you. Anna Main, it's great to see you. Uh, I, I'm talking a bit New Zealandish because it's on my mind. And, uh, you've been so brilliant in keeping me up to date about what's happening in your great country. And, and if you want to make any comments, uh, don't hesitate. Um, we can talk politics here, even if uh, it's uh, squeaky stuff, because I know you're in the midst of all that. I can see you smiling, Anna. Thank you for being with us. And uh, I just wanted to say to my brother William, thank you for joining, and uh, uh, so pleased you're here. So let's go to Sarah Phillips. Sarah, uh, last time I think we were talking about the tree. If that's true, or if it wasn't you, I'm sorry, but um, I hope all is Over to you, Sarah. Hi there, thank you. Yeah, she had an accident and um, in a park and we live near a city. There was a delay on the ambulance, um, which could have been for any reason really. Um, and it was quite frightening. Uh, I'm an ED ex-nurse and corporate nurse as well. So I'm used to systems and healthcare systems working. Um, so it was quite frightening to be there alone. Then we went into ED and it was just amazing. And they were just so wonderful. And you just think, wow, this is just wonderful. But a lot of the time I was thinking, gosh, how frightening it is to not have a system there, to, to be left alone with a screaming child. Um, and all mothers are the same anywhere in the world, whether they're in India or, or Zambia or the UK. Um, so I kind of had that feeling while I was in there. And then I suppose while I was in there, I was mother, uh, but I was also kind of stepping back and looking at things and thinking about the not being into a hospital which is quite strange. So thinking about what that experience is like for the clinicians, the porters, the, what, the, what the sense was and things. So it was just quite interesting. I'm still reflecting on it. Um, but um, it was a fascinating insight at the moment. But the thing I'm left with is I feel that a lot, there's lots of fatigue. There's still this underlying fear. Um, and then th this kind of, I call it kind of COVID-itis, this kind of idea that Oh, well, it's we can't do this because of that. I don't know why, why the ambulance said it would be six hours, um, but I haven't, followed, I haven't managed to follow that up yet. But um, you know, what, it's kind of made me think of well, the UK has got these systems and things, and why is this coming from this kind of oh, well, it's you know, it reminds me of bank holidays as an SME, all the careers shut, <laughs> you can't get anything anywhere in the country, you know, it's oh, well, it's, it's a pandemic, so. Yes, but I don't know. There's something around this kind of right. Where are we at now? How how are we COVID ready, and how are we getting strong again in our systems? That's a lovely, lovely. Uh, I'm, I'm, I saw the note about what you wanted to say. Thank you for sharing the fact that when when you were dealing with this emergency, and there was this terrible delay with the ambulance and a lot of lot of anxiety, and you were thinking, well, what's happened to us all that we're saying, well, COVID's here, so that means that everything has down or break uh, and you're, you're I think giving us a very nice reminder that, that actually we have to work for resilience in our systems and we cannot uh, get to a situation where everything is paralyzed by this fear and, and you know I've had quite a lot of people writing to me actually quite angry saying David when you talk about all the difficulties with this virus what you're actually doing is stoking fear and by stoking fear, you're making it really tough for people to go to hospital or to send their kids back to school. And 
I suppose I am trying not to stoke fear. I'm trying instead to create the idea that actually we can find ways to get on top of this virus without all our systems being disturbed. So Sarah, it's been really nice to read your remarks and, and please go on thinking about what it is that, that needs to be communicated and shared for us not to be in this situation of what you were saying, sort of slight disempowerment really. So thank you. And I hope your daughter's okay. She is wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. I'd just like to greet my daughter Polly. Uh, I think it's on. This is absolutely wonderful. Uh, and um, uh, thank you. Now I'd like to go to Tweet. Hello, Polly. Polly is in this funny phase. How are you? Is it okay to explain about your strange situation, or would you rather me not say a word? Because you're going to be going. How are you feeling today? Fine. No news, I'm afraid. The baby's not here yet. So that's it. She's, uh, the baby is waiting, waiting to decide when he is going to come. And mum is in that phase of, of just having to wait. And, and the, the elder boy, uh, Isaac, I think, is getting uh, special time at the moment because he, he doesn't quite know what's going to come next. Thank you. Uh, uh, Twee, a little word or two about the poll, please. Absolutely. So you should see the results on your screen now. Um, and as usual, we have many people coming from Europe and then always very happy to see people joining from other regions. In particular, two people from East Asia and Pacific region, which is why we choose this time slot so that it can work for them as well. In age range, uh, again, brilliant to see that we have uh, people joining from every age range. And then uh, lastly, on how we're feeling today, uh, I'm really happy to see that the one with the most responses today is the second one, sort of enthusiastic oh, um, and positive, which usually in the past it's been on the third one on optimism and hopefulness. So that's really positive. And then today um, we don't have anyone sort of in the bottom three levels, which is very good, but still a bit of uh, overwhelmment, doubt, worry and blame. And this is very good, I encourage you if you are on LinkedIn, I have created a, a LinkedIn private group chat for everyone that joins open online briefings. I'm going to put my link into the chat. So if you want to join that group, connect with me and I'll invite you there so we can keep the conversation going and where you can share anything on your mind, uh, even if you're just concerned um, and you want to share how you're feeling. And what's on your mind about New Zealand today, Tweet? Um, I... <laughs> I'm following at the moment and I would like for you to get some more airtime with uh, maybe some other outlets as well at some point in the near future. Good. We're very keen to hear. And so that's my, uh, just looking at Anna, looking at your, your, your picture on my screen. Are you prepared to say a word or two today? I never like dropping people on the spot and I saw you put a comment in the chat. Uh, if you are prepared to say a word or two, Anna, uh, um, just to unmute yourself. It's been lovely to hear from you, from you again. Hello, how are you doing? I'm not sure whether you're talking. Okay, I can't hear you, Anna, so there's some problem with the system. How's that? Yeah, Is that all right? Hello. Right. Yes. Hello. Um, kia ora. Hello everybody from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I connected, just to give it context, with David over the um, Food System Dialogue Network. Yes. And um, we held our first one in June. It was very positive. Um, and I guess it, all I really want to say is that I'm speaking to a lovely Māori woman out here in New Zealand about our food systems. And um, my specialty is trying to help large scale uh, farmers and growers around the world understand the um, absolute possibility of reducing nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers to land yeah. as much as possible. It's very destructive on the environment and on the nutrient density of food. So just to come back to what I'd just like to say, David, is thank you for your work. What this Māori lady said is she said, that let your kai or your food be your or your medicine 
and let your medicine be your food. And so I just like to say that we're working on some pretty special things out here and I'll, I'll go offline and, and call you in Florence, David, but everybody kia kaha, keep strong because we will get through this. And thank you for your leadership, David. Okay. I, this is a super special thing that Anna's here. Uh, I, you notice that Anna, Anna, she juxtaposes Maori language and uh, English when she's talking. And when we were doing our work, with people in New Zealand on food and food and COVID links. It was Anna who was able to bring together the Maori leaders to talk with us. And uh, I just think I, I want to really give a real shout out to you, Anna, for your capacity you. to include. My pleasure. Include. And we, we know that one of the things that's been an issue in Auckland is that with the latest uh, spike of cases, that Maori people uh, are considered to be at high risk, and uh, this has been an issue for government. Uh, so just to, to stress this point, that, that inside each country there are certain groups who really do seem to be at high risk. We've seen it in Australia and New Zealand, we've seen it in Europe. And Anna, thank you again for your focus on inclusion, which I just love. I'd like to move on to Loy Rago. Loy, I, I, I'm not sure where you are physically. Please. Take us into where you are and then briefly make the point, which I think is really important. Laura, you have the floor. But yeah. yeah for, for, okay, I am Indian. Yeah. I am physically in Egypt and I've been here for the in lockdown of the last five months, but I keep in close touch with India. Uh, I think the simple point I'm making is that I heard you being very health focused in the seven points, which is important and given your background and your knowledge. But uh, uh, please situate it in a wider context. And I would encourage others who are on this call to help you if you need help. I don't think you need help, actually. <laughs> but uh, uh, let's, let's bring the wider picture also into play. So that's one comment. And secondly, I, I'll make a plug for what I said earlier. I think we need to disaggregate country-wise. So we need to work at the country level to create coalitions. And uh, we need to work maybe at the regional level as well, in addition to this global level or the sectoral level, which you are leading on. Uh, and I think lastly, I mentioned somewhere, this is an old point, that there are positives which are emerging, particularly the impact on the environment. Let us capture them because they will be long forgotten when we go back to the new normal, old normal yeah. uh, in later years. So, yeah. No, I think that all your points, first of all, reminding, reminding us to keep, keep uh, multi-sectoral, but also to reflect on the, on the positives. Oh, that's lovely. And Lloyd, thank you again for being with us and for coming. I noticed that you come quite often, not every time, of course, and nobody can, we haven't got time. But it's always a delight to to see you and to keep the connection with you. Yeah, um, I, I'm, I, I treasure it. I'd like to go to Fawzia Rashid. Fawzia, again, it's nice to see you uh, joining us, and uh, um, I hope you're well. Uh, what's your take on uh, on things, either from a professional or a personal perspective? Well, first of all, thanks, and I, like everybody else, um, just so value these sessions so please I'm, I'm delighted that they're back but yeah for everybody else I have two hats one is um, I backstop the Aga Khan um, health services in terms of planning operations and preparedness and all of that um, I'm also on the board of BRAC which I'll only briefly bring in one point um, to this discussion but we, like everybody else, have been just sort of in that sort of scramble mode of preparedness doing, you know, and um, have now reached a little bit of a pause. And um, in terms of relief, uh, and have come through it fairly well because we did prepare well. And right at the beginning, just as a for example, we had, we managed to secure six months of PPE way back in January, <laughs> you know, so we were really ahead of, um, perhaps others in, in doing some things. And 
in terms of coming through, uh, we're now at a point of reflection. So one of the things I'm coordinating is the cross network learning on various themes and maybe in subsequent sessions, I'll have more to say, but in defining the themes, they were very much along the lines, David, that you articulated in terms of what we need to learn, you know, how to, how to keep services going, how to combat the fatigue, how to keep the messaging up, supplies, etc. But there was one other area that we're very keen to focus on, and that is we know we have learned a lot in terms of collaborating with government. Yeah. And so we're going to do a little bit of a kind of post-mortem on that because um, we've come out through very well because, you know, we volunteered to support. And so many of our hospitals became COVID designated, for instance, which you know, government were relieved <laughs> that we took it on or the testing or um, what have you. We, we put ourselves on the front line and through that, our relationship is generally much, much stronger. So that's, that's kind of the, the one extra. The other is that in the pause, um, uh, because there was so much fatigue, people were really sick about talking about COVID. Yeah. I then took the opportunity to get my other hat on climate back on. And so for the last three weeks, I've been um, forcing all our operations to go through a bit of a baseline um, report on carbon. So we've been calculating carbon emissions in limited way, but starting that. So today's my deadline for sending that report off. And everybody was delighted to get back to something else, but they also very much saw the connection. Oh. You know, you. in terms of we absolutely need to get onto the environmental agenda, the climate agenda, because otherwise we're going to have many more of these. So there's, you know, that part was also um, very refreshing. And finally on the BRAC bit is that we have been, when I say we, the operations in BRAC have been doing a pulse read in the various countries BRAC works in, in terms of food security, income security, and various other uh, metrics. And while things are getting better on some fronts, the one thing that is worrying me, and I don't want to say which countries, but there's an in increase in civil unrest in some of them. Yeah. So that's it from me. Um, but thank you for, for allowing me to share. Uh, well, it's very important. Everybody, I think, for this point, for this point that in the Aga Khan Development Network Health Services, they needed to create space so that people could focus on something else. And they chose to look at climate footprint to, their operations, really important. I've been doing a piece of work for a summit that had to go virtual that's taking place in November uh, on climate change and health. And I'm afraid I'm going to <laughs> rather relentlessly follow up with you because uh, mm -hmm. I want to hear more about what you, what you were able to do. Thank you for focusing on food security and the possibility of actually likelihood of civil unrest when people are hungry. Uh, we're seeing the same. I think that We've got to make sure that people like yourselves who've got fingers on the pulse and can do work across countries uh, can tell the rest of us. So um, I, I will follow up. Uh, if we can find a way to follow up, that would be great. Wonderful. Wonderful to see you again. <laughs> and now... Um, and if uh, I have to go, I've got another slot now. But thank you, everybody. And everybody, the, the style here is come in, dip in, go. Um, if, you, if you feel that you're being neglected, Put a message in the chat and so on. I'd love to hear from Iman. Iman, we have, I think you've put three comments in the chat at least. And uh, the last time uh, I didn't invite you to speak, I thought about it afterwards, but uh, tell us where you are and uh, you were going to talk a little bit about Sudan. And I think that'd be great to hear your report. Uh, Iman, you have the floor. Yeah. Thank you, David. I'll just put on my camera. It's uh, middle of the night, so I'll say hello and then put it off. Well, it's nice. uh, Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to speak. So I've put some observations now. I've, I'm back in Toronto. This is my third week uh, being back. I spent two weeks uh, in self-isolation post-travel, which is mandatory here. And uh, I was also thinking through that it would be hard for someone who has no support to do it. I know that the government is offering to support people through it, but I believe that um, 
perhaps the government is taking care of the logistical aspect of, of self-isolation, but there is the psychological and emotional aspect that would definitely impact people who do not have that uh, social circle. Um, speaking of mental health, I would also like to highlight that there's definitely more uh, cases of uh, injectable drug use uh, death, unfortunately, overdose. And uh, I believe that is part of the overall mental health impact of COVID and uh, it could easily be overlooked. So we need to really track down all of these uh, aspects and link them to COVID, map them down to the overall impact of COVID on our societies. So you're um, agreeing with Lloyd, trying to say, don't get too narrowly focused on the health, 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 not um, treatment stuff. Look also look at the broader consequences, particularly you're saying uh, mental health and uh, wellness. And I think that's so important. Yeah. Very um, much so. I am a strong advocate of looking at the social aspects of health, the social determinants and so on. And I'm seeing a lot of that going, perhaps not well tracked down to COVID. I wish to, to speak a little about uh, developing countries. You know, I come from Sudan and I have been supporting the country's health system along with my doctors, colleagues in diaspora throughout COVID. Uh, what I am observing is fatigue of the system. The system is already uh, weak. The health system itself is weak. Yeah. So resources have been drained. It's true that there is PPE, but the attention of doctors, the level of training, the readiness of people to be cautious around the virus yeah. is slimming down, both within the health system and in the society. Yeah. And that's pretty dangerous. And I suspect that the, the tracking of cases and death is not well charted as the first few months. And that's another layer of, uh, of danger, I would say. Yeah. So these are just a few observations. Lastly, I've been thinking throughout the last couple of weeks that if we look back at the international health regulations and the obligation of countries that when a country fulfills its obligations, it, it achieves what it is supposed to do, then it has an obligation to support other countries. So I believe uh, strengthening our messages, our advocacy messages towards that end of, uh, I mean, I worked on IHR and we score it from one to five. Yeah. Five is the best score. So when a country reaches a score of five, what next they need to support other countries and i believe we have a role to play to advocate for right. that thank you very much david lovely thank you Iman, and thank you this is important this this session is for people to be making clear things they believe and the rest of us taking them on board and putting them into our overall mental image and and i'm very grateful to you Iman. if others do want to speak we've got a few more minutes left just Make sure you put a note in the chat or do a, a, a big wave. I, I, I try not to look at the images when I'm talking, but I'll see. But I do want Annie Felton to come in because Annie was going to talk to us a little bit about her reflection on uh, a new outbreak in a chicken processing plant in Norfolk, the UK. Um, there's some quite interesting issues around all these food, food factory outbreaks in Europe and um, North America, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. So off you go, Annie. Yes, thanks. It's the equity issue again, really, because if we do something about food processing and food becomes more expensive, we have a real problem with food poverty um, here. Yeah. Um, and I, I, which might seem unusual since we're supposed to be such a rich country. Um, and also it gets, it, it's the way it's getting into the um, community with community transmission. Yeah. But I think if I can have one minute, what is really disturbing me at the moment, and I just realised how, how distressing this is, is that the way we are currently governed is making, in, 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 the, in England, is making the struggle for, with COVID much harder. Mm -hmm. um, we've got enormous levels of institutional disruption from central government. 
and, and, and this is across all sectors. It's, a, um, it's across, local government is about to be overhauled. Education, the civil service, one of our senior um, private, uh, sorry, one of the senior secretaries in education was sacked, but the, but the politicians have done nothing. Um, we're facing Brexit and I, what is really peculiar is just this level of disruption yeah. which makes policy making and actually getting our messages out um, so much more difficult and it's, it just seems to be getting much worse. Um, so that's really a creed occur. The, yeah. What I mentioned in the text is this classic thing I'm always banging on about, about in, inequality and equity. Yeah. But our quality of government in this country is just appalling. Well, I do think um, uh, Sorry about that. COVID is revealing some of the uh, structural challenges in governance and, and you, you can't do COVID unless people can come together locally. It, mm -hmm. Otherwise it goes wrong. And if, you, if your governance processes actually work against local integration, then it's a big problem. I personally think that uh, the debate around uh, local governance uh, in, in the UK as well as in other uh, European countries is going to become very strong uh, precisely because of the reasons you've said Annie. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm just um, checking um, Godfrey, you're there uh, and what I don't know is whether you're um, you're able to speak. Uh, last time you couldn't because the mic wasn't working. So just tell I want to hear how you are and how things are in Tanzania. Uh, and, uh, and sorry, can you hear me? Sorry. Uh, uh, some back I think great. Uh, and I'm not sure what what the problem. I can't hear you well. Uh, uh, you're you're connected on two machines. I'm wondering whether. Uh, one of the machines is, uh, anyway, uh, it, 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 I couldn't hear you very well until the very end. Uh, yes, John Atkinson is asking whether you've got two screens open, Godfrey. Anyway, try once more, Godfrey. It'd be just lovely to hear from you, because when you, when you put your mouth close to your microphone around your neck, we actually could hear you then. No, well, it's not working. And anyway, we will we will find a way to hear from you, Godfrey. It will... Hello. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Thanks. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, I don't have many things to talk today, but I want to take this opportunity to thank you and encourage you that the work we are doing here all together, and uh, you, definitely Nabaro, and the entire uh, for SD team has a huge impact not only on the international community yeah. but also on, on our respective government. Uh, last week on Tuesday 10th, I tried to identify many on insight from Tanzania as a country and also I gave advice to the health sector in Tanzania on what it should be done when building back better from COVID as a country. Uh, to remind you that I advise that because the government and his excellent, uh, Mr. President Johnny Pombe Magufuri, have uh, improved the uh, healthcare infrastructures and that it was a, a good job well done. And regardless of few resources and the global economic crisis, yeah. uh, Tanzania will need to recruit more healthcare workers uh, to fill all this good uh, healthcare infrastructure. Uh, so I'm very, uh, very relieved today to see that our government has now issued a permit from the president's office, regional administration and local government yeah. to employ about uh, 164 uh, doctors who will work at all these local uh, government authorities. So may I say that this show that our discussion here is great and is contributing and making impact in many parts of the world. I would like to conclude by thanking you, uh, Dr. David Nabarro, the entire team for SD, uh, and all the participants, not only for the knowledge and skill we are gaining here, but also for providing us with a platform, especially for us to represent other young peoples 
uh, to make our contribution and to raise our voices on various uh, sustainable development issues. Lastly, to my government for all they are, are doing to make sure uh, that the health for all Tanzania become a reality, particularly to this time of COVID-19 and the, the economic crisis. Thank you. Oh, great stuff, Doctor. Thank you very much for those remarks. And now I'd just like to give a, 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 a moment to a couple of people uh, from the team just to give us some sign-off remarks. John Atkinson, if you'd like to come in, uh, I'd love you to uh, just to make any uh, final remarks before we close. Uh, Catherine, if you want to come in. And um, uh, um, William and Twee, if you want to uh, un unmute and come in with any observations, that's fine. Uh, but uh, I will only bring you in if I see you flicking on my screen. If you don't uh, turn on your video, I will not give you the floor. So I can't see John. I can't see uh, William. I can, can't see Catherine. I can't see Twee. Uh, so this is, um, uh, I asked Florence if you want to come in. Okay, so everybody, uh, what we do now is we look at Jack's uh, illustration. We invite Jack to tell us what he feels it conveys. I think it's beautiful. I think absolutely great, just so you know. But Jack, you have the floor to just talk to us about how you illustrated this briefing. Oh, well, that's very kind, kind of you uh, to say that. I don't know if I've got anything particularly intelligent to say. I don't think I'm sort of particularly qualified to. Um, yeah, no, I'd just like to say thanks for having me. Um, it's great to kind of get to eavesdrop in and, um, uh, and just try and keep up really with the conversation. I suppose the only, th the only thing that kind of the key takeaway I got from today was the emphasis on uh, addressing kind of inequity of all kinds. It's yeah. um, kind of vital to coping with the problem. But yeah, otherwise, I don't think I've got anything. Well, I can tell you, I love the brain with the uh, with the kind of lines coming out. With Catherine's nodding as well. We're both <laughs> thinking that's so cool. Oh, thank you. It's sort of got that thing. It's not about the numbers. It's about the capacity of society. I mean, I'm delighted that you got that point because that was meant to be my heart of what I was saying. And then you go into the indicators, and and no, you know, we will have this narrative which we, 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 with with another go at repeating the indicators because we feel that it is so important to get that message out and the sort of stuff that I keep trying to get across the government. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And everybody, let's really celebrate what Jack and his colleagues from live illustration are able to do. We are blessed to have you giving us this kind of material. Uh, thanks again. Um, just to say that we are going to put a recording of this uh, on YouTube and on uh, our website, www.4sd.info. Godfrey, thank you for sending us a picture of what you've been up to. Uh, uh, we actually have all the illustrations on our website, uh, and, and these, <laughs> these are showing just how totally cool live illustration is. That, that this, that there are some people who do this really well, some people who do it less well, I just happen to really like what these guys are doing. Guys, because it's mostly been men. Uh, we've got a newsletter that TWE uh, produces. That'll be on the website. We'd love you to sign up for it. And our next session uh, will be on Tuesday afternoon uh, at around 1700. Same sort of style, uh, around half an hour uh, from me, um, pulling things together. And then uh, we will have the interactive discussion. Any comments you want to share with us, please join Twiz um, uh, uh, WhatsApp group. And with that, uh, I'd just like to say bye bye. And uh, Karen, thank you. <laughs> it's lovely. And uh, Polly, I just want to you are. I just wanted to get the picture. This is Isaac just trying to work out what's going to happen when his baby brother arrives. Uh, and Isaac, we are very pleased to have you with us. Anna, thank you for being with us. Lovely. Um, best wishes to everybody uh, in the New Zealand gang. Louisa, thank you for joining. And with that, we will uh, tune out and uh, look forward to next Tuesday. Lovely smile, Sarah. Thank you, Anna. Bye-bye, everybody.